So as we get started, uh, not everyone knows how the committee works or what the committee is. Uh, there was a question that was asked in person in one of our prep events that uh, it seemed quite obvious, but it is a great question to start with. What's the organization behind TC39? All right. Hi, I'm Aki. Uh, no. Oh, mic check. we have mic a mic. Check. There we go. Yeah. Hi, I'm Aki. Uh, I am part of the chair group um, for, for 2019. I work for PayPal and Braintree. And uh, TC39 is the 39th technical committee of an organization by the name of ECMA International. ECMA does, is a standards body, like, you know, ISO or that kind of thing. And they publish the standard that we work on as a committee. And so that's the organization behind uh, TC39, and the, the committee itself is made up of uh, people who are sent by member organizations, that's companies and nonprofits who are part of ECMA. Uh, so we are all considered delegates. Uh, we, are, we either work for or are associated with these companies that are part of ECMA International. Uh, so we, we work together and collaborate on uh, what goes into the spec and how we're going to uh, be able to make improvements and changes uh, and support all the different ways that JavaScript is used. Thank you, Aki. Uh, and the next question that we're going to do just to set up the stage, uh, what TC39 is and does, is how does a proposal actually move through the committee? Now, Tara did a wonderful introduction to our four stages. But we also have Jace here on stage who just did a wonderful talk about his Rust engine in JavaScript. Uh, and he's been doing more work with the TC39. Specifically, he's been getting a proposal through called All Settled. Can you talk a bit about the process of getting such a proposal through a uh, committee? One, two, there you go. Um, so, yeah, I was quite lucky to, to meet a lot of people on the committee last year in London. Mm -hmm. And I felt that a lot of it started off with actually just a conversation and talking to various members of the committee if there was an appetite for such a proposal. And uh, it turns out that it was, and that was a good thing. And so uh, Daniel has, has been really helpful in uh, putting me in contact with the right people. And um, not only that, but there's people who come from different backgrounds as well. So that's really helped. It started off by uh, what we call a straw person proposal, which was just a stage zero, and anybody can make that. Um, and that was just a Git repo with you know, identifying the problem space. And then uh, we managed to get a champion for that, which was Matthias, who's not here, uh, but he's from V8, and he really helped with me on that. And so stage one was basically just identifying what is the problem here, what's the limitation, and, and how we can fix it. It's, it's not too important to, to have a solution at this point. And so we managed to craft something up that worked. We had a, we had a very sort of small proposal that uh, got through. Matthias championed it, and we reached stage two. And then for stage two, uh, myself and Rob Pamley, who's not here from Bloomberg, uh, but we both worked together on um, some of the specification and also getting sort of more ideas from people as well. Also, another good thing is after stage one, we had implementation from Babel, uh, which was really good. Uh, so that also helps as well when you get feedback. And then stage three is more getting even more feedback and sort of thinking about a candidate release. And uh, luckily, uh, I don't think there were too many sort of uh, rejections or limitations, and most people seemed happy with it. And uh, very recently, we made, we made stage three as well. And so now, I think it's, uh, it's just getting um, some implementations in browsers, and people can try it in Chrome and Canary and uh, Nightly. And then it's about getting more feedback and, and uh, hopefully, yeah, stage four. Yeah, soon. And you uh, made this proposal not as a member of the committee, but as an uh, independent contributor, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was back at the BBC at the time, and it was a limitation for me as a JavaScript developer. And I thought, well, if it's a limitation for me, how many other people out there have this limitation? And so one of the ways of working that out was going to NPM, seeing how many people were downloading these external packages and thinking, other languages have this natively. Is this something that we can do in JavaScript? And uh, like I said, I was very lucky. I just contacted them. Everybody here was very friendly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a conversation with members of the panel, and uh, they were very happy to champion it. And we went from there. Yeah. And I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself and which company Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> Jason Williams, a software engineer at Bloomberg. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes.
so another question that we get sometimes is, OK, so we've got this whole uh, proposal structure, but how do we know it's like implemented correctly in browsers? What's going on there? Uh, well, I'm going to hand this over to Valerie, and if you can introduce yourself uh, and how we do that. Hi. Hi, I'm Valerie Young. I work at Boku. I'm an open web uh, engineer. And I, uh, I'm also the editor of the internationalization extension to JavaScript called ECMA 4.2. It's the Intel object that does pluralization and daytime formatting. But also, uh, as part of my work at Boku, I help maintain the test 262 test suite, which is a test suite of uh, the JavaScript or ECMAScript implementations. Um, so the test suite is uh, about 35,000 tests, which test <laughs> the, very, the, the individual tests, which test JavaScript. Each uh, test is a test file, um, which has some metadata about what line it tests in ECMAScript itself. Um, and then each test is run twice, so really there's 70,000 tests, once in strict and once in non-strict mode. This is test262.report, which is a website which shows how well these tests are doing on all of the four um, JavaScript engines, Chakra Core, uh, JavaScript Core, SpiderMonkey, and V8. And the tests are each in an in individual test file, so this is a directory structure which rep shows the test structure that you can find. Um, and if you want to look at the source, you can drill down and look at individual tests and whether or not they're, they're passing and see the source code on the page of this website. Or you can go to uh, our GitHub, tc39 slash test262. Um, and to get a, um, a uh, standard in ECMAScript or a new proposal in ECMAScript, the last stage includes adding tests to test262 to, to test as well as browser implementation. So while the browsers are implementing, there's also tests being contributed, and all of the browsers can make sure that they're in compliance and, and passing the same tests. So it's a, it's a fun project. <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Fantastic. If I could add to that. Um, this is actually really an awesome resource. We, uh, Jace talked about implementing a JavaScript engine, but for our major JavaScript engines, having something like this to be able to say very easily, when are we not being spec conformant is such an immense resource, so. Yeah. And can you introduce yourself? Oh, yes, I'm <laughs> Ross Kersling, and I w work at uh, PlayStation on our WebKit team. Thank you. Uh, so this sort of rounds off our introduction to how uh, TC39 works. We're going to be moving on with community questions that you folks asked. And we're going to start with one from last year, asked by Sam Basson. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I doubt it, though. Uh, he asks, uh, I notice the committee is very heavily dominated by Americans and American companies, particularly Google. Do you have any plans to become more representative of the world and only give certain companies so much power? Well. <laughs> Um, we are looking at how it, individual um, companies and specifically um, individual spaces where we get together in person are impacting those, uh, those con contributions. And ECMA International, which is the organization that um, we are part of, in fact, is currently putting an effort into helping us find a way to be more inclusive internationally in future years. Uh, the 2019 meet, uh, meetings are all already scheduled, but 2020 is being scheduled right now, and, and we're going we're gonna to work on finding a way to be more inclusive. Thank you. That was a very nice answer. Wait, can mm -hmm. I just mention? We, uh, hi, uh, I'm Daniel Ehrenberg. I work uh, in Egalia in our compilers team. Uh, so I, <clears throat> I think there, there is a real issue of, of this particular kind of bias that was identified, but I just also want to point out that there is heavy European involvement in the development of the JavaScript specification, both from, uh, from people in the Munich V8 office, as well as from Bloomberg, and from uh, my company, Galia, based in Spain, and, and uh, several others, also from, from Modable. And so I think we can, we can build on that success. Also, Yulia, of course living here in Berlin. <laughs> yes, I'm based in Germany, and I'm based in Berlin, so if you have any complaints, you know where to find me. <laughs> uh, thank you both for that answer. Uh, moving along into uh, more specific questions about the standard, uh, we've had several questions about how long it takes to standardize things and when do things come out. 
uh, like how long does it take for a proposal to go from stage zero to stage four? Take that one. Um, it can take a very long time. I mean, the simple answer is years. Um, but if you were to, essentially, you wouldn't really expect to go through our staging process more than one per uh, meeting, and we, we do meet every other month, uh, but you know, there's a lot to do in that time frame. Um, implementing in Babel uh, will take time, for instance. You may need to, of course, the problem space uh, that you're addressing might be quite clear, but the solution might not be. Maybe you need to revise that multiple times. We've seen that happen. Decorators might be a great example. Uh, and finally, at the end of it all, we need, before we can say that we're all said and done, we need this to be implemented in at least, and shipping in at least two of the major engines. And you, unless you want to implement that yourself, might not have control over that time frame. So it can take a very long time, and discussions can get very heated. And so um, unless you have a very simple, very uncontroversial proposal, it will probably take on the order of years. Thanks. The next question that, oh, do we have anyone else who wants to chime in? OK, great. So the next question that we have uh, is coming from Nikhil Ra Ranjan, Ranyan, I'm not sure. Uh, and uh, he is asking, when are we going to get a standard library for JavaScript? Oh, yeah, you too. Um, so uh, from the way I see it, uh, we already have a standard library in JavaScript. We have a bunch of functions, you know, math, JSON, array, all these maps set. Uh, JavaScript has a, a pretty, pretty, well, I, I was going to say pretty big standard library, but that's just not true. Um, so I think that's what this question is really getting at, is uh, can we have a bigger standard library for JavaScript? Can we have more things in the standard library for JavaScript? Another thing that people often bring up in this context is, um, you know, should we put the standard library in modules instead of where we're currently putting it, which is in globals? Um, and these are pretty interesting questions, and I'm definitely um, supportive of, of exploring them. I've been working on them myself, um, partially from the website. Uh, I am Dominic Danicola from the Chrome team uh, at Google. Thank you. Um, and uh, I, I want to mention especially the efforts from our colleagues at Apple who have put together a proposal titled JavaScript Standard Library Focused on let's, let's add some of these new standard library features as built-in modules instead of built-in globals. Uh, yeah. And uh, we're, we're looking into several concrete proposals in TC39 about features to add to the, to the standard library. You heard in Tara's talk earlier today about recent, recent additions like object from entries. Uh, and there are other things that we're considering putting maybe in built-in modules or maybe in the traditional way as properties of uh, objects that are connected to the global. We're looking into Temporal, which is a new date time library, which could be uh, make it so that you don't need to use Moment. We're looking into possibly a UUID standard library or a library for uh, iterator helper methods like iter tools in Python, as well as, uh, as, well as methods on set and map. And uh, we'd I think we, we're missing a bunch of things that would be useful to have in the standard library, and so it'd be great to have more, more help from, from contributors about this. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to, to mention that you know, some of these library type features have been some of the most successful pro proposals in getting through the process more quickly. Um, so you know, I mentioned that features can take years, but we've also had features that take you know, six months or eight months because they're, they're kind of just, you know, oh yeah, everybody agrees. We should have a from entries method on object. Um, we should have a finally method on promise, that type of thing. Um, the last thing I want to add is that when we talk about the JavaScript standard library, I think it's important not just to look at things that come from this group at TS39, but also things that are just available across the ecosystem and that ship with JavaScript runtimes everywhere. And that includes things like URL or text encoder, which are in both browsers and in Node and in other runtimes if they wish to implement them. Um, there's a bunch of examples like that. Yeah, and you'll, you'll hear more about the integration of URL and text encoder and, and other uh, browser web APIs in Node.js in, in Joey's talk later today. But uh, I think Dominic and I are really trying to break down the barriers between different standards groups and make sure that we can all work together to, to build a good uh, JavaScript standard library. Thank you, Dominic, and thank you, Dan. Uh, moving on to our next question. 
Uh, we have a question that's been given to us anonymously uh, asking, often we're having discussions that are unrelated to proposals and are related to like larger questions around TC39 and there doesn't seem to be a place for them. But yes, discuss is not really being used. Uh, is there any plan to improve this? Funny you should mention. We are currently working on having a, a new discourse instance. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to be able to uh, figure out what people really are talking about so that delegates who have limited time, I mean, we all also have day jobs, we, we do this you know, uh, in addition, can really engage with what the community wants to talk about and it'll give us the ability to um, have those conversations in public and hopefully be less of a black box to people because we, we really do want to engage with people. It's just uh, hard to find each other when what we talk about can be so esoteric. Oh, we had a little funny thing with Mike. But that, that was all, right? Yeah, okay. Mike and Mike uh, Mike actually, we have uh, another slide here. If you want to check that out, here's a QR code and you can go to that directly. I'm going to leave that on for a second. Um, thank you, Aki. Uh, moving on to the next question, and we've had this the last two years. Uh, it's on the pattern matching proposal. Martin, uh, William Martins asks, I've not seen any movement on the pattern matching proposal. Is this proposal in an idle state? Also, if this proposal lands as a statement, well, what will be the heuristics to decide when using it uh, or a chain of if-else? Uh, do you think having pattern matching as an expression would be more beneficial? So that's the first question. That's a, that's a big question. Hi, I'm Kat Marchand. I am uh, part of NPM Inc. And I am also one of the co-champions and co-authors of the pattern matching proposal. Uh, the proposal is kind of stalled right now. Like as we talked about, like these things take a lot of time right now. Uh, sometimes um, what it's at right now is it's waiting to be proposed for stage two. So as soon as I get it ready to like show up at a meeting and actually ask for stage two, then it might hopefully step up there. Um, as far as the the statement versus um, versus expression thing, that's a much harder problem. We have uh, Dan actually proposed a really interesting solution to the, to the statement and expression problem. For those of you who don't know, like the, the pattern matching proposal currently um, uh, is only a statement, so it doesn't allow you to like directly assign from the pattern matching thing because it has like ergonomics that are more similar to other things like if and else and all that stuff. Uh, do you want to say something about what you proposed? It's just really hard to evolve the grammar of JavaScript. Uh, there's, there's a lot of things in it already, and there's a lot of things that sort of happen implicitly. Uh, so to, to sort of work through this, there, there are various different solutions, and uh, that's, that's sort of why a lot of these proposals take time at TC39, because for a big proposal like pattern matching, we need to consider a lot of different alternatives to, to work through these kind of technical issues and find something that's really going to be good. Again. All right, and we have a second question about this from last year. Uh, Leonard Koch asks, uh, what are your thoughts on reducing the capabilities of the pattern matching proposal, expression to statement, in favor of language cohesion? Um, so, uh, I guess I kind of answered this already, didn't I? You might have. Sorry, I, I was. I, I think I might have answered this already. Um, you know, the idea is is I don't like the idea that it's a statement. Mm -hmm. I want to get something out there because I'd rather have a statement than no pattern matching at all. And my hope is that once we have it as a statement, we can use that as justification to bring more uh, conditionals into expressions, so that maybe we can start discussing, say, bringing if else into bringing an expression, and then. The, the, the trouble is like the semantics in the language don't make it particularly easy to say what the result of a, uh, of a statement like thing will be if used in an expression position. Um, and kind of like there's one proposal that's out there answering those questions and I kind of wanted that proposal to at least start exploring that before giving a solid answer. That's the do expressions proposal. Whether or not you, it's required to wrap it with do is up to the future, but we need to answer the same problem regardless of, uh, of what we use. Thank you. 
excuse me. <laughs> oh no, I have a mic right now. Ah. <laughs> Okay, next question, moving right along into questions surrounding language design. So we had one question from Marvin Hagemeister. Um, are there any, this is also from last year. Are there any long-term goals? Uh, what's the bigger picture for JavaScript in the next five years? This one, uh, hi, I'm Shu, I work at Bloomberg. Um, so JavaScript is many things to many people, including all of you in, in, the, in the community here. That is the same for us in committee. It is many things to many of us in committee. We have different personal visions, personal aesthetics for what we want the language to be. And perhaps we're also constrained by what our companies would like uh, the language to be for its use case. And it is a committee language. So it is not a one author language where it's much easier to kind of exercise your singular vision for, for better or for worse. So the answer is, it's really hard to say what the five-year picture or what the big picture for what JavaScript is right now. It's, we're trying, always trying to work out a consensus between the many different visions that people bring to committee. And I want to kind of, the, the usual response to this when you hear this is, well, it's going to be a mess and it's going to be just full of compromises. It's going to be things of, full of things that uh, people don't like. But I think in practice, it's, JavaScript is, is eminently useful. It keeps getting more and more popular. It's used basically everywhere on the front end, on the back end. And I think you know, we've done a decent job, and I hope we can do a better job at uh, bringing more cohesion. But there is going to be no singular vision going forward. It's going to be very difficult to get that. But I hope to, to have consensus on practicality and what's the most important thing at the time. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is about how transpiling impacts JavaScript. And the specific question is as follows. TypeScript, ReasonML, PureScript, Babel. JavaScript has become the target of many compilers. How does this fact influence your work on the, job, on the language in general? Everyone, uh, so I'm Henry. I work on Babel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think JavaScript is what it is today because of you know, CoffeeScript, Tracer, being able to use features before they're implemented. I think that's an opportunity for the whole community to be involved, whether it's making new proposals, you know, testing them out when they're in early stages, although we warn against doing that in production. Um, and yeah, just being able to be a part of, uh, you don't have to be on the committee, but being able to be involved, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and moving on to the next one uh, from Soren Bruce Frank. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I doubt it. Uh, when writing new features, where do you look most for inspiration? Is it other languages? Which ones in that case? Or is it mostly driven from requests by the community? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. okay. Very quickly, um, I, I, again, it's, the answer is many things to many people. But uh, for me personally, I've always very much wanted to bring new capabilities to the language and the web that it could not do before, uh, like what we have done with shared array buffers to, to bring kind of threads and shared memory programming to the web, and as we hope to do soon, weak refs. Yep, I definitely want to second uh, what Shu said, but I, I want to say from my perspective as somebody representing the Chrome team, we were interested in what makes programming on the web easier. And so when we think about like new features, we're like, what are people commonly doing? You know, what shows up popular? What's a popular pattern for writing websites and that is, that is hard because of JavaScript today? Um, an example proposal, which I kind of started but, but never really followed through on, is something called blocks, where it's like, oh, we want it to be easier for people to write web workers like inline in JavaScript um, because we think concurrency is important on the web. Things like that is, is one motivating factor that at least one member of the committee tries to use to, judge, to, to govern this process. Uh, and we're going to have to round off to our very last question, uh, which is from, uh, thank you so much for that answer, Dominic, uh, which is Mark, uh, oh, I'm not going to try that. <laughs> uh, with all the new operators and features that are being added to JavaScript, is there a risk that the language will have too cryptic a syntax for new developers? I'm very much in favor of them, but web development uh, being approachable is a very big boon. I guess we're almost out of time. I'll try to answer this as quickly as possible. But we do consider that very strongly with every proposal. Uh, we have a notion of a syntax budget that basically you know, exemplifies the idea that there is only so much syntax you can take before you're just 
completely overwhelmed in trying to use a language and so uh, we want that to be comfortable. We don't want to overshoot that, um, but we do want to make use of new syntax where it really is worthwhile. We'll have a couple of quick one back and forths. Sometimes uh, adding a, just a little bit of new syntax can make programming easier. Like a lot of programmers are excited about the optional chaining proposal where you use question mark dot instead of dot and then if the object is undefined it still works. So sometimes even adding new syntax can make things easier to program. So we consider this as a trade off not a absolute. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much to everyone uh, who is on the panel and thank you all for being such a wonderful audience. Uh, as always, we are looking for different ways to help people uh, participate in the process and also to help us get the best data. One thing that we are doing right now, it's an experiment that's currently running. Oh, I forgot that slide was there. Uh, we currently have an experiment running. If you want to participate in it, here, this is very finicky. Here's the link. Uh, please feel free to, uh, to go to this URL and take the survey. It's going to help us figure out whether or not experimental data works for the committee process. And that is all for our panel. Thank you so much, everyone. Oh.